But, but I'm share, but I want you to share. You know, like I, I, very simple, I tell folks, or I ask folks actually, I'm like, so what does it feel like if you go longer than four hours without a meal? And right there, most people will say, well, I can't, you know, I gotta have something every two to three hours. That's the majority of the patient population I've worked with in my career. And then I say, well, let's say they can do easily four hours. Then the next sort of flaming hoop is how do you do after dinner? Do you need something before bed? Do you need a snack? Do you, do you crave something sweet? Do you crave a dessert after you finish dinner? Are you satisfied at the end of just a regular meal without a dessert? Most people also say no. They usually want a sweet treat after or a little after eat, you know, bowl of ice cream or a little snack before bedtime. That's also a clue of metabolic inflexibility. And then I say, are you able to go finish dinner and have nothing but water until you break your fast 13 hours later. So let's say finishing dinner at 7 p.m. and not having anything but water until 8 a.m. Are you able to do that and how comfortable is it? Again, vast majority cannot do that, which is shocking to me. I've been doing this for so long now that I can easily, easily, because I've worked into it, I can easily go to, I've, I've, done a, I've done a 10 day water fast, mm -hmm. right? I've done longer fasts with things like broths and you know things like that, but I can easily do three, five days without even blinking. You were on, the, the first time I interviewed you, I think you were on day five of the water fast too, by yeah, the way. I did, I came to you guys on that. That's like, and I do that really routinely, three to five days every month without fail. And I do a big 10, um, 10 day or you know once or twice a year. Just and water. Yeah, just water and I and salt. I put a lot of salt into my water mm -hmm. as well, um, and I take magnesium. Um, those are the those are really my two go tos. But that's that's about it. And most people can't. You tell them that, and they just look at you. You know, we're so petrified not to eat, and yet for me, and you know, back in my story, because I had a bowel blockage in the beginning, and because I was so filled with with fluid, so known as a, a malignant ascites, I literally had no place to put food. Or beverage. And so whatever I put in would come back out or cause excruciating pain. And it wasn't coming out the other end either. So for two and a half months, I could do manage only tiny sips of water and herbal tea. That is probably what wow. saved my life all the way back then. It still took us another nearly 30 years to get the research to back why that was effective for me, despite the fact that we've had data from Dr. Moreshi in 1909, showing that simply fasting um, cytotoxically reduced the size of a tumor, so shrunk mm -hmm. tumor size. So when Dr. Longo's work started coming out in you know, 2010, 12, 13, I was so happy to see this because he's like, then if you take fasting and you pair it with chemo, then you get like a synergy, like a double whammy, and you protect those healthy mitochondria from the damaging effects of that chemo or of that radiation so that you're also not making more vulnerable. I mean, that's the nature of standard of care for cancer is that it causes further right. metabolic mitochondrial destruction. That's its job. And yet what we're learning and what makes me sad that it's not already standard of care, despite the fact that we've had almost a decade of research to say it's or longer to say this is good, is that we could be making standard of care work better better outcomes for the patient, better quality of life for the patient, lower recurrence and progression of disease, and not and not needing all the side drugs that cause even more problems like constipation and high blood sugar, et cetera, that they give along with the chemotherapy to deal with the side effects of the chemotherapy. The fasting in and of itself is dealing with those side effects. Mm -hmm. So it's just so weird to me that we've come this far and yet I still cannot even tell you. If I get one doctor out of a hundred that I consult with or consult on a family with who tell me what the experience is, uh, has been with their oncologist who completely full heartedly supports them doing fasting around their chemo. That's, that's a good number for me. So I, I would like to see that be one in 10 in my lifetime. Wouldn't it be great if it was every single one? Oh, but gosh, yeah. I, so it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I love that. I love that. Uh, and that's the way it should be. There was a study, maybe, you know, the study that showed what was it? A seventy less than seventy percent chance of um, reoccurring breast cancer when the patients fasted for thirteen hours or more each day. And the craziest part about that, they didn't ask them, "What are you eating?" They could have right. been like, feasting on ding dongs and ho hos, right? I right. mean, it could have been that, but they were simply taking a break for thirteen hours or longer every day, and their recurrence rate was far less. Now you have to remember, in standard of care, even the American Cancer Society. 
suggests that set up to 70% of patients who've had cancer will have a recurrence. So you want to do whatever you can to prevent a recurrence after you've gone through that little ride. So to me, it's like if you could just get all patients after chemo, if nothing else, get your hands on everybody after chemo and radiation and surgery and fast them for 13 hours a day, wouldn't that be incredible to see what would happen at the five-year rate and all the different things we're looking at. I think it would change the game quite drastically. Absolutely. And 13 hours is not even a long time, right? You use your sleeping window. It's very easy to do. Um, you know, so speaking of fasting, what are some other ways we can do? What, what are some other things and tools we have available to us to support the mitochondria to create this mitophagy, mitogenesis, and this hormesis yeah. response? What are some of your favorite ways to do that? Well, we've kind of talked about the big ones. Fasting, um, you know, is, is one of them. I also really love um, for folks that are new to this, that are pretty metabolically broken, who are the ones who say, oh, I really struggle going more than a couple hours without food. I start to do things like just slowly lowering their carbohydrate intake and slowly upping their quality fats and then bringing on things like herbal teas, like cinnamon, adding cinnamon to everything. Mm -hmm. Cinnamon is excellent at stabilizing blood sugar. It also has a natural sweet flavor to it. So a lot of people like can give sweetness to things that otherwise doesn't have it. So if they make a homemade whipped cream, for instance, sprinkle a bunch of cinnamon on that and it kind of makes it taste like it has sugar in it when it doesn't have, you know, any additional sugar. So Things like that are little fun hacks of just out of your tea world. Of course, tannins from black tea and coffee also can stave off hunger. So if you are a CYP1, A2, you know, AA or CC fast metabolizer of, of caffeine and you don't feel bad when you drink a cup of coffee, then having a cup of coffee or a cup of black tea, um, even if you add a little fat to it, like a little ghee or coconut oil or even MCT oil or butter um, can really be a powerful strategy to offset that hunger and help you over some of the hurdles, but it also helps you give a break to the GI tract and help your body literally sweep out, you know, the debris, make room for more. That's a big one. The other thing that um, I think is also really powerful in the herbal world is berberine. Berberine yeah. is a big, big herbal. I mean, it's been I used started, in Yeah. Are you using it? I started experimenting with dihydroberberine, which is a different okay. variation of it. Yeah. So it's interesting. Yeah notice just out of curiosity well i'm about to get a cgm to really test it so yeah. i'm just having it if i know i'm gonna have a big meal i'll just take a capsule but i'll get some good like anecdotal de evidence yeah. when i get my cgm yeah I, I love it a little in of one but i find that that can also help give people a running start and then for my really aggressively metabolically broken people we might have to bring out the big guns like metformin um, even if someone has the sip 2 c9 star 3 snips that make metformin not a good long-term process for these folks, I can at least use it short term to get them ahead of the curve a little bit, maybe enhance their other therapies. Maybe I'll put them on that through radiation because radiation will not work if your insulin and insulin A and A1C are elevated. So it might look like it works initially, but it also makes for more rogue, more aggressive cells, more mutations and more progression. And yet I've yet to meet a radiologist who does a full glycemic panel, insulin panel, oh. insulin growth factor, A1C panel on any of their patients. Luckily, thank God we have a few like Dr. Christy Kesslering, we've got Dr. Brian Lewinda, we've got Dr. Um, Colin Champ, some of these radio oncologists out there, Dr. Lori Hersher. These guys are out there who are absolutely checking their patients, getting them more metabolically flexible and kind of gearing them up for radiation, fasting them through radiation, having them take exogenous ketones 20 to 30 minutes before they get into the radiation. I wanted, to, I wanted to ask you about that, the exogenous yeah. ketones and radiation. Explain more about that, please. Oh, so amazing, because this is the place where I, I'm always cautious of talking about exogenous ketones because everyone's like, oh, it's our human nature, right? Like, well, screw that. I'll just have my cake and eat it too right, by taking yeah. exogenous ketones. So please, you will never get as good results with just exogenous ketones as you would doing it really the old fashioned way. Amen. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> And definitely, like, especially people who are new to going low carb or going into ketosis or needing to get primed for a particular chemotherapy or radiation therapy that really does depend on having a low glycemic and low insulin state to have better outcomes, then we want to give them a running start. It will also really nip it in the bud, that horrific carb 
flu carb withdrawal that a lot of patients experience. And it can also help quench that hunger in the beginning until your psychology catches up with your physiology. It can be a nice crutch. And then once you become fat adapted, you typically don't need that. But even my fat adapted folks, I like to have them take an extra little punch, a little extra pressure, an extra little push in the system to even drive those ketones higher in the midst of radiation because it's going to be that much more protective to the healthy tissue around it. And basically kind of think of the ketone, exogenous ketones as being like the Trojan horse that carries the radiation right into the cancer cell and protects all the healthy sort of members of the community around it. And that's a really powerful strategy um, especially like for instance, brain tumor patients who in the beginning when they have initial surgery and maybe initial radiation, acute radiation to deal with a very, you know, pretty critical situation, a lot of times they have to get on a short burst of um, steroids, which just basically make it almost impossible to get into therapeutic ketosis or even nutritional ketosis for some people. So the exogenous ketones have a huge role there. And then if I have someone who's like kind of fallen off the wagon, and they need to get back on it. Like maybe they went on a family reunion or something and they kind of went on a bender that definitely helps them ease the transition back into, you know, so they can kind of dust off their pants and be right back on the horse again. Because I think that that helps because sometimes the psychology to get back on track is really hard to overcome. And I find that the exogenous ketones can help a lot, but if people have a good mental reserve, I tell you the fastest way to get into ketosis is a three day water fast. Now, if you don't have any other major health issues, you know, nothing out there, work with a medical provider and, and analyze if that's okay for you, but that can really up it. It might be kind of painful to, you know, like, so I tell people, keep it simple. I schedule things like a, you know, um, massage and time off work and lots of naps and like get a bunch of Netflix or something and just spend those first two days, like being ill, like just being kind of like the flu, like you would take care of yourself if you had the flu. And then by day three, you're sort of like, the lights are coming on. Mm -hmm. Can I keep going? And if folks are doing well and we're testing and their ketones are coming up and their glucose is going down and they're taking in enough electrolytes and hydration and they're feeling great, then I'm okay if they keep going. I wouldn't want them to go longer than five days without medical guidance. But it's just pretty incredible that kind of that first, the hardest part of those first couple of days, the first day is all psychological. The second day, your physiology is screaming at you. Mm -hmm. The third day, most people pop through it and are like, this is pretty cool. Um, and then once you get more seasoned at it, it becomes easier and easier. But I do have patients who are set to do a three day water fast every month or a five day around their chemo. And they will take exogenous ketones on day one and two, just to help them still function and feel pretty good. And not everybody feels crummy. So I reserve that for those who know that they might be climbing a pretty high wall. I love the routine. So question right there is for, for the exogenous ketones, for somebody going through radiation, chemotherapy, what level of ketones do you want them to be at? Ideally, I want them in therapeutic, which is above three on the Keto Mojo. So 0.8 to three is considered nutritional ketosis. That's like, that's kind of like where all of us can kind of easily go in and out of normally. Some of us get there more readily than others. If I fast for just 16 to 18 hours, my ketones get into the twos. My husband has to fast for three to five days to get his that high. Mm. Everyone's different. So don't like beat yourself up if you're kind of in that zone. For people to get into a level of three and higher, you either have to be very metabolically flexible or you have to be really taking in a ton, like a 90% of your diet fat type yeah. of thing and or taking exogenous ketones. So if I take a little hit of, I like the ketone esters. Um, if I take a little hit of those, like a five milligrams or whatever of that on top of being in my kind of nutritional ketosis, 16 hour state, I can pop myself into nutritional or therapeutic ketosis pretty easily. So it's just kind of interesting that everyone be your own um, in of one, be your own mm -hmm. living laboratory and experiment for yourself and see what you notice. Cause I've also played with it where I've taken the whole recommended dose. And for me, it it's like, it overshoots me. I get into like the nines, the tens. I don't wow. feel good. It yeah. like, it just feels chemical in my tissues and I don't need to push it that hard, but other people may have to take the whole container before they feel anything or before mm -hmm. their numbers shift on the keto on the keto mojo so it's so unique that's why i'm kind of intrigued I, I cgms for my cancer population can often add more insult to injury because it's so variable just the stress of the diagnosis and all going to all your treatments and all the different medications and all the things i mean so many drugs for cancer cause metabolic 
inflexibility. Mm-hmm. Like they're just known, like all the serms and the aromatase inhibitors, so the tamoxifens and the arimidex and all those, they cause fatty liver and diabetes, right? The PICRE, the PIK3CA drugs that are out there, targeted drugs now for cancer, directly black label says it's gonna give you diabetes. And yet this is a metabolic pathway that is all about, like if someone tests positive on their tumor assay, that's the best treatment of that PIK3CA pathway is a ketogenic diet, <laughs> is a low glycemic diet. And yet the very pharmaceutical drug we give it actually creates more of the problem. It's crazy. Changing. Oh it's my gosh. Nothing buts, my friend. And so, yeah, so those are the places where I want to support my patients to have their best chance at, at having a good response to the, ther- to the therapy and not having to go and do that dance over again in the future. You know, and again, ultimately, I'd love for everyone to start exploring their own metabolic health way before they have any kind of diagnosis. So we talked about just those questions you asked, but also get an A1C, get, a, get an insulin level. You should be healthfully under five um, for your insulin and under five for your A1C, all of us. If you have cancer, you probably need to be a little bit lower on your insulin and insulin growth factor because that is a definite growth factor in more than 70% of cancers. Mm -hmm. So we need to suppress that a little bit further. But for your best prevention and maintenance of any condition, keeping your A1C under five is probably a really good strategy. Yeah. What about about some of your favorite inflammatory markers? Oh my gosh. Well, my trifecta, my patients call it, that's the C-reactive protein which is also, by the way, prognostic for many things. So if you have an elevated CRP at the time of your breast cancer diagnosis or colorectal cancer diagnosis, you have a poor prognosis. We saw that same prognosis for entering into the hospital system with COVID, for instance. That kind of comes back to the cardiolipid thing you just talked about because CRP initially was a marker for cardiac health and cardiac inflammation. Right, and And it it still says it on on the LabCorp results. Exactly. And so it's, it's checking that inflammatory process at that lip, at that layer we were talking about a while ago. It's pretty fascinating. It's particularly we're looking at the other one is sed rate, sedimentation rate, ESR. Now this one, you know, you'll often see that elevated. It's how fast your blood fall, your blood cells fall out of plasma, out of solution. So if it falls out really fast, that's great. It's like, good. It's nice and smooth in there, right? It's like, it should be under 10. It should fall out quickly. But if it takes a while and they kind of just hang out in the goo, well, that should probably tell you right then and there. It's probably kind of thick and gelatinous and not good. You want flow. You want it to be nice and lubricated and smooth. The higher that number, the more inflammation in the in the tissues as well. And then the third one, the LDH, lactase dehydrogenase, this used to be part of all of our uh, metabolic panel testing until about 15 years ago when some idiot behind a desk said, let's not run that test. That is the most important test for your metabolic health there is. Mm. Lactase dehydrogenase, as the name implies, is part of the good old Krebs cycle. And it literally, as my husband says, if the LDH is high, your mitochondria are off. Mm. Right? What's high? What would you be considered at what number? And this is the thing. Remember, labs are based on the average of the population. So you don't right. want to be average. So in the functional optimal range, you want, depending on lab core, you want it under 175 or Quest Diagnostics, you want it under 450. If it's even 176, I'm concerned, or 451, Mm. I'm concerned, right? If you end up having high CRP above 1 or 0.1, depending on the lab, and a sed rate above 10, and you end up coming back with actually a weirdly low LDH, like under 160, get your LDH isoenzymes, because sometimes some of us have some particular uh, genetics that give us kind of erroneous or false LDHs. Mm. So I look at them as a collective individually, you could Google any of them or PubMed any of them and see that even by themselves are quite prognostic in the cancer world. But very specifically, when we're looking at them as a collective, they literally tell us the health and wealth of our mitochondrial function, our metabolic function, our inflammatory function, our immune function, our terrain function in general. So for me, the trifecta has been far more sensitive and specific than any cancer marker and than any scan. Mm, I love that. So I'll put, we'll put those down in the podcast notes if you missed that. So for LDH, you're saying 160 to 175 is where you want the person to be? Yep. Okay, got exactly. it. Wow, That's this good. has been such a masterclass. We got to bring you back for round three. I mean, I could just talk to you for hours. You're just so brilliant and fun. Um, besides your book, The Metabolic Approach to Cancer, which I'm holding up on the YouTube video, but we'll put this in the notes down below. Where else can they find your work and just your social media and all that? Well, please look for me on Dr. Nasha Inc. on Facebook. You can also find me under the Metabolic Approach to Cancer on Facebook. 
Um, on my website, drnasha.com, I have a great kind of couple little free handouts, including one that's on metabolic flexibility and some of the research that we talked about today and some of the different roads to Rome to achieve metabolic flexibility. So that's there for free. I also have a really cool little free handout that if you are diagnosed with cancer, what are the first five steps you should take before you start to let mm -hmm. anybody so important. Up, right. Look, so there's that. And then one thing I want you guys to keep watching for, keep checking me out, get on my newsletter. Things are some big things are happening. We are hoping to create the first and only metabolic centric terrain centric forward hospital in the United States. Wow. It's bringing in the best of both worlds of what best of what standard of medicine, standard of care medicine can offer with the best integrative vetted therapies from around the world under one roof on one campus, a big, beautiful campus where we are showing people how to live in accordance with their genetic match as well as nature around them. So that's that's what I'm working on these days, including another book coming out this summer, um, late summer, early fall on mistletoe. And then Jess and I are working on an updated version of our book in late 2022. And there might even be another book brewing. It depends mm. on what our energy levels. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> so yes, there's a lot of cool stuff there. I'm really excited to see the world of research and the bench experts coming together with some of us out in the trenches of, of clinical medicine. And we're really finding some beautiful synergy on how can we make things better for all of us. Mm, I love that. I love that you're doing that. The new book, we'll get you back for the new book. And then we'll put everything down below in the podcast notes. Go show Dr. Nasha some love on social media and go check out our website. Go get her book. As you can tell, so much information, some great information. Uh, Albert Einstein said, intellectuals solve problems, geniuses prevent them. And you, Nasha, empower the world to be a genius and to be proactive, not reactive. And I want to thank you for serving the world, serving myself and my community. And I just love having conversations with you and just you're doing amazing work out there. And thank you. We need more Nasha Winters out there. So thank you for today. And I really enjoyed today's conversation. Thank you, Ben. Always a joy. I brought in one of our first. Hey, everyone. Um, our, our research department tells me that this is the best performing mint ad ever. What we are finding in the literature is.